Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 286, Bioidentical Hormone Risks. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Dr. Maupin is a specialist in bioidentical hormone replacement, emphasizing replacing lost testosterone, but replacing all of the lost hormones that, that we lose as we age. And it is still a somewhat, uh, somewhat of an outlier as a medical practice because the, the medical industry has <laughs> been resistant to the idea of bioidentical hormone replacement and hormone replacement. So different doctors who do research uh, and don't necessarily see patients and don't necessarily treat symptoms, but instead massage and accumulate data from their research publish articles saying that the bioidentical hormone replacement is risky, uh, that most of it is uh, derived from compounding pharmacies and not from mega pharmacies, big pharma. Uh, It's not often, for women at least, uh, accepted and regulated by or accepted by, licensed by the FDA. And so there's a momentum of resistance to doing hormone replacement with bioidentical products. So recently we found an article entitled Bioidentical Hormone Risk written by Dr. Santoro uh, and is published in biospace.com, April the, 20, April the 14th, 2016. And Dr. Santoro basically does two things that we want to talk about today. One of the things that she does is attack the concept of using compounding pharmacies for anything because they're not consistently regulated and safe. Uh, and the second thing that she does is say that the data suggests that women who receive bioidentical hormone replacements don't gain the benefits that are claimed for that. Right. And so we want to speak to both of those claims in this week's HealthCast. Dr. Santoro was blatant in her accusations, but she didn't defend her accusations very well in this article because... She, she basically has done research, and I think I need to ex- explain what research doctors do when they're teaching other doctors. So research, research doctors write papers and do research. They're professors they're, at, a, at a medical school. At a medical school. S- school or at a residency program like I went to. And they teach younger doctors or doctors in training by being in their clinic, which they say they're seeing patients, yet they're not really talking to the patients. They're not in the room with the patient. They sit outside while three or four residents or medical students go in, get the history, talk to the patient, decide on what they want to do, and then they come out and present to that doctor what they'd like to do. To me, that's not really talking to a patient. That's not That's not really taking care of the patient. I mean, like you have. And yeah, and I have a relationship with all of our patients. If they want to see me, they come in and see me. If they want to just get their pellets, they just get their pellets with my nurse practitioner. But I'm always looking at their chart. I'm always in charge of their care. And I'm always there to talk to them about what's going on. I know what's going on with every one of our patients. Yet this, the, I've been in this in this type of situation, so is my daughter. She trained in family practice. Basically, the clinical doctor that's teaching is doing research using numbers that may be derived from the clinic, but they're not really talking to patients. Now, patients, when they're talking about bioidentical hormones, are basically, you have to talk to them about this. You have to say, how well did you... Did you um, recover from your symptoms and and are we all the way there yet have we made you all the way better have we made you and you have to actually have a conversation about that and what were the side effects and can we fix that and can we change the dose that is really taking care of patients with bioidentical hormones now 
this particular doctor is not really qualified to talk about bioidentical hormones because she's an infertility doctor. Now, infertility doctors don't see anybody who, unless they're pregnant or want to be pregnant at any point in time, whether they're 20 or they're 40, they're not replacing hormones for quality of life or to, to actually um, make someone better. They're trying to make them pregnant at all costs. So that's what infertility doctors do. And they do use certain things that may be not produced by a, um, by a big pharma, but she doesn't even think about that. They use bioidentical progesterone and oil shots to keep a pregnancy going once it's started. And she's not even thinking about that fact, but they all do, do that. But she never sees people for bioidentical hormone replacement for symptoms after menopause or symptoms after, like I do for men, after andropause. So her situation does not make her an expert in this subject. Mm -hmm. So that's my first gripe with this. Mm -hmm. The second gripe is it's just simply not true. All the things that she says about bioidentical hormones made at compounding pharmacies is clearly made by someone who's not ever used them or understood how to use them. The best part about bioidentical hormones is I can figure out a dose and do any dose I want and have that put in a pellet for my patient and have that actually given to the patient, but even sublinguals. We can use sublinguals with different doses. So, so when you work with a compounding pharmacy and you have a relationship with a patient and you figure out what you think that patient needs, what the, the chemistry set balances might mm -hmm. be, then you can order a dosage that's specifically generated for that patient right. based on what you request. Right. But it's big not pharma off the shelf, everybody gets 0.5 milligrams of Right. Dose. Big pharma, no matter if you're we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. no matter if you're six, seven, or if you're five feet mm -hmm. and you're an adult, you get the same dose. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. If you're male or female, you get the right. same dose. Right. And they and they haven't even tested us on most drugs. They've only they've only extrapolated that we need the same dose as men because they've tested only men. So that's my, my argument with big pharma. I have a lot more I have a lot more leeway to decide on a dose for somebody and adjust it. You know, when I used to do vaginal um, hormones for women, I could put estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone all in the same in the same little tab, and they could put into the vagina, and they got all of those hormones. Mm -hmm. And I could specifically change one of the hormone doses, right? And they would as make it. You saw it, the symptom response, as you saw the right. blood tests that come back and say this patient's getting better, not getting better, is developing some other side effect. Then you could rebalance the content of the medicine. Mostly, the side effect was. It's working for the estrogen. I don't get hot flashes anymore. Right. It's working for the progesterone. I'm not bleeding, but I don't have enough sex drive. So then I'd have to increase testosterone. Or they're bleeding, so I've got to increase the progesterone. So I could actually do that just like doctors used to well, a long time ago when we could make our, make our own prescriptions for well, our make up patients. Your own medicines, you yeah, know. make up our own medicines. That's what we used a long time ago. That's a hundred years ago. Well it's interesting to me too that this this doctor works in Colorado and two of the compounding pharmacies that you've used for years are in Colorado. And, and these are, two have never screwed up. Yeah. I have never had a dose from either one of these two pharmacies in Colorado that has ever been wrong or not what they said it was or um sent the wrong dose for the wrong person. I've never had a problem with that ever. Right, right. And they are very compulsive about that because they know everybody's watching them. They're not FDA approved for patients, but they're FDA monitored. FDA comes in and evaluates them Regular. all the time. And so does the state of Colorado. They have yes, their they own do. regulatory agency that comes in. So for her to live in Colorado and not know that two of the best compounding pharmacies in the country well, or maybe not care. are in her own state, I don't, I don't think she even... You know, has uh, used compounded drugs. I honestly don't think she's ever used them. Well, <laughs> I mean, that makes a you know, difference. We're in the midst of the silly season called election. Right. <laughs> and one of the things that the, they, the pundits say all the time is follow the money. Right. And so a question that I have is who does the funding for the research at the university? Right. Well, at the bottom, it has a whole bunch of different, at the bottom of this article has a, many different drug companies and other sources of, of, income for this article, which yeah. means this doctor. Mm -hmm. 
mean, that's, I don't know, not everyone so you, knows this. That, we're, but, we're not accusing anybody of any malfeasance. No, we're just saying. We're just saying that their view is, you know, the drug company says, I want this test to, to turn to out like this. this. Yeah, exactly. Well, you can structure a study to make that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think everybody understands that every bit of research in the United States, except maybe 1%, which is often done on bioidentical hormones, is paid for, all the non-bioidentical hormones is paid for by the government, NIH, FDA, or it's paid for by groups who are fronted, are fronts for the drug companies. You know, the, the, right. the pharmaceutical companies develop other corporations that they then name a, I don't know, at a donation or a foundation, and then they give money so that they can further their drugs. And this is a big threat to them. Bioidentical hormones are a big threat for all of the all of the drug companies. They're losing market share because they're, because they're generic from right. the get go, and mm -hmm. that way the big pharma can't make any money off of those. They can't control right. them. They can't limit the distribution. Uh, so part of what they do then is manipulate the FDA mm -hmm. in terms of the FDA's response about uh, approving some of these mm -hmm. drugs as well. But we pay for the FDA in our tax dollars. We pay, we pay for the NIH in our tax dollars. Does that mean that they're listening to us? No, they're listening to Big Pharma. Where's the money? Follow the money. So there's no big money in bioidentical hormones. Yet, the next question is, why do women need Bioidentical hormones. Why do if, women? If need they're them? solving our problems, if they're giving us what we need, then why why are women having to resort to find a doctor, which is not that easy, who does bioidentical hormones? So you're suggesting that pills made out of urine from a horse, which is FDA approved, Premarin. may not meet all the requirements for all the women out there. Well, it's 17 horse estrogens, mm -hmm. and none of which are exactly like ours. So I'm not a horse. It doesn't necessarily help me, uh, but that's what where it comes from. <laughs> well, I have another objection to Premarin, but that's because... Uh, well, what's that? <laughs> I just go on. Um, they get the urine from pregnant mares, pregnant horses. Mm -hmm. Then they kill the babies uh. so, that the, so that the pregnant horses can then become pregnant again. Mm -hmm. But and these horses pregnant. aren't like... Horses you would see, you know, on television. These are just wild horses. Any horse will do, and they're just using them to get pregnant and kill, kill all the babies, especially the male babies, because they're not going to do them any good. Right. And so then the rest of the babies that are female, they'll keep some of them to be pregnant again, pregnant for them to make mm -hmm. mare's urine, urine. But if you really want to take mare's urine, that's, that's a real good question for the FDA. Where do they get that idea? Mm-hmm. I mean, seriously, they could make it out of, they could make estrogens out of chemicals. They've always been able to do that, but I guess it must have been cheaper. It's, a, it's I don't know. You know much. I don't, I don't know where that, how that happened initially. That was before my time, way before my time. So let's think about why, why women have to do this. Men have. I don't know, 10 to 15 different ways to get their testosterone that are approved by the FDA, that the FDA has blessed and has said, this is safe, safe for men, but women have none, mm -hmm. none. They, they don't even think, they don't even allow the thought that testosterone is a female hormone, which it is, to come, come across their desk. That's not going to be something that they're going to do. Well, another issue that... But why is that? Tell me. Why do you think that is? Well, I think the FDA has pretty much always historically been run by men. Big Pharma has been run by men. Mm -hmm. Big Medicine has been run by men. And women have not been part of the test protocols for evaluating medicines mm -hmm. because they might get pregnant. Yeah, and that. so what they've done... And actually, we, we did a podcast one time on a, a physician who works for the FDA who said women are the same as men, except they have all those pesky hormones. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so we should be able to medicate in the same way. 
-hmm. But, you know, new research is showing that women have different symptoms that identify heart problems Mm -hmm. and potential heart attacks coming that doctors need to know. And they have not historically been taught that women are different and the Mm -hmm. numbers for women are different because women haven't been studied in the same way. That's been in the last seven or eight years. And we found that. uh, And now they do allow testing for women of all age groups to Mm -hmm. be incorporated in the databanks. uh, But they historically did not allow women to be part of the protocol. Right. So the decisions, the dosages, the rates of normal, all of those things have historically been defined in terms of male numbers. Well, you know, the cholesterol issue, it's usually a male problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, our cholesterols are fine until we hit menopause. And then if we replace our hormones, usually our cholesterol stays, stays good most of the time. However, depends on what we take for menopause. However, Cholesterol, high cholesterol is the big ticket item right now. There's a million drugs for it. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going to be on it before it's over. And it wasn't really meant for that. But it doesn't, women don't need it and don't respond to it very well. They weren't tested with it. So the cholesterol drugs were for men. The All of the drugs for ED are for men. All the testosterones are for men. I mean, there's many different like illnesses that are are usually male illnesses and like heart disease was traditionally a male illness so that was the last thing that the government decreased its pay to doctors for so they would always get the best doctors for heart disease Mm -hmm. cardiologists got paid more than obstetricians gynecologists surgeons that did female surgery and that has been the last holdout in excellent pay is heart surgeons and cardiologists Hmm. they're hitting them now but that's the last in the line everybody else was hit years ago yeah pediatricians psychiatrists they've been at the bottom they've been at the bottom because of course we say we we care about children and we say we care about women but that's just that's just what we say. That's not what we do. And I have to look at the actions of our own government. Women do workarounds. We have done workarounds, and we found a better product than they would even offer us. We've got better estrogens by doing a workaround the FDA, workaround the um, med- medical community. Even American College of OBGYN stated several years ago that actually it was 1999 because I took my reboards then the proper uh, well PMS is a progesterone problem it's a low progesterone problem they stated in their test that progesterone true or false is a hormonal illness or a hormonal condition I think that's how it was stated and you you were supposed to say no that was the proper answer but now back years when you took that's 99 the board. Yeah. right 99 so that was way back then and then you know 15 or 20 years later they're slow they figured out yeah it is an es- it is a progesterone problem and it's a estrogen dominance low progesterone issue we treat people with progesterone then they get better but it has to be non oral they know that right and they haven't approved many drugs that are non oral progesterone so We still use, and have I've used it since the 80s, progesterone suppositories, progesterone tabs that go in the vagina, progesterone under the tongue, and now a new progesterone that's bioidentical called BLA that you get to swallow. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do all these other things. And it goes through the lymph system without being made into other estrogens Ah. like oral progesterone would be. Right. But, But they didn't know that. I knew that in the 80s. In my 1999 test, they still didn't know it. They didn't know it for another 10 years or 10 to 15 years. And then here we are. Well, but in the 1990s, most of the gynecologists who were in the college of OBGYN were male. That's true. And the decision makers were male. That's true. And <laughs> Except for a few women. And they kind of were trained by men to think like men. Right. And so they, were, they weren't really on our side at all. They weren't really trying to help other women. They were just trying to fit in they with got the guys. Their spot and they were trying to keep right. It. Yeah. Right. So so many of these things have happened and articles have been written that discredit the really good answer women have found mm-hmm. to no testosterone for us and very few compounds that work for us for hormone replacement. Well, it's not unique 
to this issue for women. Okay. It's it's not unique at all. We're gonna our next podcast uh, is going to be about PSA testing, and the same issue occurs in PSA testing, mm -hmm. which is that doctors were taught to believe that a certain thing was true, and mm -hmm. especially with regard to men getting uh, prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And the data now strongly shows that what they were taught was exactly the opposite of what is true. But yes, the physicians who are presenting this research and presenting this information and suggesting we need to re-examine the truths of our profession are being criticized and categorized and pushed aside by the inertia of the massive That's medical right. system that exists. That's right. And so anytime something new comes along that goes against what people have been trained to do, trained to think, trained to know, there's resistance, which per perhaps that's the nature of things. Yes. But the physicians that you and I deal with, because we're involved with uh, anti-aging medicine, which is kind of a new field, mm -hmm. uh, they talk a lot about how that resistance is harming their patients and that mm -hmm. a lot of the aging people in the United States are suffering unduly and unnecessarily because there's stuff out there that can help them that the system is rejecting. And some doctors and uh, will tell your patients, she's crazy, she's wrong, this is quackery, <clears throat> let's stick with this. About this me and know. about them. They tell them they're crazy. Yeah. They should see a psychiatrist because well, they've because got a hormonal. that's a traditional response. Go see a psychiatrist. Yeah. You, you know, you're, you're getting old, you're getting <laughs> Those crazy. Those poor psychiatrists. And there's medicine for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they've always given us medicines that were psychiatric drugs. Yes. Yeah. So and they keep trying to do that. They gave us a psychiatric drug for, for PMS before they admitted it was a hormonal problem, and they gave us psychiatric drugs for well, And you might be crazy, libido. but not because your hormones are out of balance. Well, yeah, there are some, I mean, we have both things play, good play things but could happen, men, yeah. men can be crazy too. No. So, but they, but it's always the first step. Yeah. The first step, the first thought when judging a woman is, oh, she's crazy. Well, historically, you <laughs> Which know, is kind of interesting. In, in my field, historically, uh, alcoholism was a male concern. Mm -hmm. Women had depression. Right. <laughs> and a lot of the women that were diagnosed as depressed were closet alcoholics. That's true. You know, they hid at home and drank all day. So now we know more. We know better, and we know how to treat that in women as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just, education is slow to evolve, and, and vested interests are slow to change. So this article, is something that we wanted to make you aware of because there is data out there that your doctors are reading, that your doctor has been trained to, to see, that says bioidentical hormone replacement's not a good thing, not a necessary thing, uh, and it's coming from uh, compounding pharmacies, which are all bad too. So <laughs> well, let's get rid of all that pesky stuff. So they can make more money. Well, in the name of good health, in the name of what science well, knows. Well, that's how they scare us. Yeah, exactly. So Dr. Santoro put another nail in women's rights. It, intentionally or unintentionally. But we, we don't she did. Know Dr. She Santoro, nail in the coffin. So. Yeah. But she still did it. So whether she figures it out now or she figures it out 10 years from now, usually this kind of thing comes out that she was either paid by for her research or paid to just make the statement in some way don't believe everything you read or or here <laughs> thank you for listening email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com you can find the biobalance healthcast on itunes and on youtube for more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.